We're good? Okay, there we go, there we go. All right, we're government affairs people and we like to talk and we're already running late, so I think we probably need to get going. So we don't further get behind. But um, good morning, everyone. Uh, great to see you all here. Uh, I'm Mike Leonard, Vice President of Government Affairs for ASA. We're gonna spend the next 40 minutes or so doing a deep dive into government affairs. We've touched on it already some with Glenn and Mary Beth's presentation, but we'll uh, open the curtain back a little bit more and give you more of a behind the scenes look into what uh, I and the rest of the government affairs team here at ASA do. But before we get started, I'll begin with what I know you all came here for, which is an outline of my, my presentation. Uh, when I was in grad school, my uh, advisor always harped on, uh, any talk you give, you need to have an outline. It's really important for your audience to understand expectations going in, to follow along as you go along. I was a fishery science major. Um, I now do fisheries policy, so I've forgotten 99% of what I learned in grad school because uh, science doesn't really matter when it comes to policy, um, and that's only a half joke. Um, but I did remember about the outline, so uh, it wasn't all for naught. Uh, but we'll start with uh, just the basics of uh, the government affairs team, who we are, uh, how we operate, um, a little bit of a, a case study or a few case studies into how we measure success, and then we'll talk some uh, about issue spotlights, and that's where we'll invite the rest of the government affairs team up here to talk through uh, issue by issue within each region, uh, what, what's going on, what, what issues you need to know about. But let's start with the basics. So here's the team. You saw uh, this earlier in a slide that Glenn had up there. We'll start in the top left corner. So Larry Phillips is our Pacific Fisheries Policy Director, handles marine and anadromous fisheries issues from Alaska through California, and every now and then when he gets lucky, something in Hawaii too. Uh, Connor Bevins, our Inland uh, Fisheries Policy Manager uh, based in Alexandria. Um, you see he's got a pretty big territory, uh, which is why issue prioritization is so important, something we'll talk more about later. Uh, Mike Waynes, our Atlantic Fisheries Policy Director. He handles uh, all things Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, Mid-Atlantic Council, New England Council. Gary Jennings, Keep Florida Fishing Director. Uh, Gary's been with us since the start of Keep Florida Fishing, handles both policy issues as well as uh, helping to manage that coalition. Martha Gaius, our Southeast Fisheries Policy Director. Martha is also based in Florida, does a lot uh, in the state of Florida as well as South Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico issues. Ken Haddad's been with us for over a decade, Southeast Fisheries uh, Consultant. Uh, Ken was formerly with the, uh, the head of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission, so has a ton of expertise, uh, primarily helps us out in the Gulf. Um, in the D.C. area, you've got uh, myself, I oversee government affairs, try not to get in people's way, uh, handle kind of national, high-level, um, federal policy uh, and issues. Annie Chester's in the second year of her uh, two-year policy fellowship. Uh, Annie helps support the entire team as well as a, a wide range of special projects. Uh, and then last, George Cooper, who's a, a consultant uh, lobbying firm, Forbes Tate Partners. Uh, both he and his entire team at Forbes Tate help us a ton with relationships on the Hill, um, uh, policy expertise advice, uh, both with Congress and with the administration. So it's a great team, uh, tremendous policy experience, expertise um, to help really uh, throughout the country. Uh, the pillars that we operate under. So three main pillars, pretty much any issue that we work on would fit in one of these three areas. Uh, conservation. So making sure there's a lot of fish out there, uh, healthy fish habitat, uh, clean water, so that when people go fishing, they, they're, they're fish out there for them to catch. Access, this takes the form of both you know, physical access, boat ramps, um, ensuring that anglers can get on the water, as well as you know, more regulatory type of access. Um, whether you're talking about generous seasons, bag limits, size limits, or uh, when you're talking about spatial management, ensuring recreational fishing is allowed, uh, when you, uh, things like marine protected areas. And then trade and commerce. You know, we are a trade association representing businesses primarily, so ensuring that there is a, um, a solid uh, economic environment for you all to operate in, especially on issues that are specific to our industry, like uh, the federal excise tax, uh, tariffs, duties, uh, every now and then attempts to regulate certain types of fishing tackle. So a lot of different issues, but they'll tend to fall into uh, at least one of those three categories. It ends up being this, these work through a lot of different agencies. Um, this is just a small snippet of the different agencies that uh, we have to work with uh, at the federal level, state level, regional uh, advisory bodies. Uh, this is why having a, a broad government affairs team that's able to work with um, representatives in these agencies, understand how the regulatory processes work, uh, because for one person to try and plug in with all these different agencies and the many that aren't on this uh, picture would be awfully overwhelming. Uh, so it's a lot to keep up with, which is, um, which is why we have to have a team that's got that expertise. It often feels like this, like whack-a-mole. This is the best graphic I can come up with. Really, our whack-a-mole would extend, you know, well past over the horizon with a lot more holes. Um, 
But uh, you know, there's long-standing issues that we'll always be involved in no matter what, but then we have to be ready to respond when things pop up that were unexpected, like right whale vessel speed restrictions that we'll talk some more about uh, the rest of this week. Uh, and this is, again, why having a team, uh, the, the more folks you have out there with more mallets to help whack these things down, uh, the better we'll be. Um, I put a bunch of words here on the slide. I would encourage you not to read all the words. I'm trying to impress you just by the fact that there are going to be a lot of words on these slides. These are um, lists of issues that uh, the government affairs team is working on. Not, not necessarily issues that we're just sort of monitoring, aware of, but rather what are we actively engaged in trying to drive the outcome, whether it's uh, you know, writing letters, meeting with policymakers, uh, drafting legislation, uh, currently things that we are actively heavily engaged in. And you can see it's, it's a lot of molds that we're, we're currently uh, working on. Uh, so we've got a lot of issues, but how do we actually engage in these issues? Um, and, and first, how do we identify what are the issues that warrant our engagement? Because there are many, many longer lists than what I just had on the screen of things that are going on that impact the industry. But we can't do it all. We can't get involved in every single issue going on in every part of the country. So to help us in sort of guiding what type of issues uh, warrant our involvement and what level of involvement we'll have, this, uh, these are criteria that our Government Affairs Committee helped us develop a few years ago. Um, it was at that time aimed at freshwater as Connor's juggling all these different issues uh, and hearing about a lot of things. But really it's applicable across the board in what we do. Uh, so I'll quickly run through these guidelines for considering ASA's involvement. First is, is there a benefit to the industry slash angler? That one should be pretty self-explanatory. Uh, next, member agreement. So not necessarily consensus. We're going to poll the entire membership and is this an issue we should get involved in. Uh, this is where the Government Affairs Committee is so valuable in having a group that uh, knows the issues and that we can run things through and uh, get their input on whether this is an issue that both um, warrants our involvement and then what type of position should ASA have on that topic. Next, can ASA affect the outcome? There's a lot of issues out there that um, either there's already a lot of cooks in the kitchen uh, engaging in it to where us coming in probably isn't going to change much on it. Um, or it's pretty clear that there's a predetermined outcome. Uh, sometimes it's still worth fighting the fight, but if it's clear that you know, ASA is not going to be able to affect the outcome um, because it's a predetermined type of thing, is our energy, uh, time, resources better spent elsewhere. Next, is it a parochial issue uh, or is it precedent setting? And sometimes it's, uh, you know, this is sort of an eye of the beholder thing, but if you look at an issue and it's pretty clear, you know, it's a hyper-local thing that um, is pretty unique to that one area uh, and, and no one else is really talking about it versus something that may seem fairly small uh, when viewed in isolation, but if it starts here and has the potential to spread, uh, you know, is it better off, are we better off trying to nip that in the bud from the beginning? Um, a lot of things that happen in California fit that description of let's try and stop it uh, before it starts spreading elsewhere. Um, next, can ASA provide a distinctive voice? And generally the answer to that is yes, because especially on a lot of conservation issues, you've got folks talking about environmental um, reasonings behind their position. Uh, you've got individual anglers talking about the value of them going fishing. But for us to be able to talk uh, from your standpoint about the jobs, the economic impact that our industry has um, and the importance that conservation plays and all that is really, it tends to be a unique voice uh, and argument that ASA can help bring to the table. And then last, uh, to me, maybe m the most important of all these is local capacity. It's pretty rare, if ever, that ASA is going to swoop in uh, from D.C. or wherever we are and go tell a local you know, county commission or uh, state agency or state legislature how it needs to be managing its fisheries. Um, without that local support of local angler clubs, state fishing groups, um, you know, we, we need that type of partnership that we can help come in and provide added value working with folks there on the ground. Um, to provide that added voice, but you know, you need to have uh, the folks there on the ground heavily engaged in these issues to ultimately have success. Uh, so we've identified issues, we've run through the guidelines, how do we operate? Uh, how do we actually engage in these issues? And I'll first, uh, I'll instead kind of talk about how we don't operate, because this still tickles me. This is a, um, a press release that the Center for Biological Diversity put out earlier this year on the federal spending bill, and, and um, I'll read this clip from it. Um, this budget is an environmental catastrophe and a colossal failure of leadership by the Democratic establishment. It's good that Senator Leahy, who's the lead, um, the, the top Democrat on the Senate Appropriations Committee, is retiring as he's clearly not up to the task of protecting our environment for all people in this nation. We only hope that Chairwoman Delario, Chair of the House Appropriations Committee, Democrat, and Speaker Pelosi, I think you all know who she is, uh, considering retiring as well in light of this travesty. Now, if they're saying this about Democrats, imagine what they say about Republicans. Um, so I don't know a ton about the Center for Biological Diversity, um, but from what I can tell, they are a litigious uh, organization. Most of the work they do is filing lawsuits against the federal government to try and get whatever outcome they want. 
Uh, so I don't know that they work a ton with Congress, so maybe for them, you know, name calling, burning bridges isn't that big of a deal because they're not working with these folks that much anyway. Um, that's not an option for us. You know, we, as I showed earlier, we work with a lot of different agencies, a lot of different folks. You know, we have to maintain good, strong working relationships to where, you know, bomb throwing, name calling isn't going to work for us because uh, a member of Congress who may be our champion on one issue uh, may be against us on another topic. We can't let that opposition, you know, tarnish the relationship and, you know, be someone we're never going to work with again. You know, we'll talk with that office and try and, you know, explain our position and try and change their position on it. But, um, you know, again, we're not going to be the bomb throwing type of uh, way of operating because it's one, it's, you know, not, not an effective way of generally convincing people of your position. But, you know, we've got to maintain good, strong relationships and be viewed as a trusted, respectful, constructive voice in, in these conversations just to have you know, the potential to have a positive impact on the many diverse things that we're working on. So how do we measure success? This is a question I get sometimes. It's an interesting exercise to kind of go through to determine, you know, are we heading in the right direction? Are we successful in what we're working on? Because policies, you know, there's a lot of gray in what we do uh, in, in what type of outcome you're going to get. So there are ways of measuring success. Glenn showed some of these earlier. You know, did a bill pass? Did it get signed into law? Uh, did you get longer red snapper seasons? Did you get recreational fishing allowed in Marine Monument? Did you get more funding for things like culvert uh, removal uh, and repair um, and, and on and on? And, you know, again, we've had some successes in that area. But, um, you know, sometimes these things are kind of hard to, to pin entirely on, you know, ASA did this, ASA did that. Um, and then I also think of other things where, uh, you know, the Driftnet Modernization and Bycatch Reduction Act, a bill that I spent a ton of time on. Bill Shedd came up to, and testified before Congress. Uh, ASA and many other groups, the last Congress spent a ton of time and energy uh, moving that bill through Congress. And despite a lot of opposition, got it passed through the House and Senate. Um, and uh, we're feeling really great. And then January of 2021 comes around and then President Trump vetoes it. I think it was one of only two bills, like legislative bills that he vetoed in his presidency, which is not necessarily a, uh, an honor we were looking for. Of course, in January of 2021, President Trump was doing a lot of unpredictable things. Um, so that's the outcome, you know, and I'm not sure that there's anything we could have done to expect that, predict it, um, but that's what happened. So if you just look at that in terms of wins and losses, that was a loss, but I'm not sure that speaks to all the work that went into getting it to that point, because on so many of these things, we're not the decision makers. We do everything we can to advocate uh, for decision makers to make, uh, make the call in our direction, but there are things that are out of our control as well. So I'll sometimes try and find other less tangible ways to determine are we heading in the right direction or things going um, in, in a positive trajectory. And I've got three examples I'll go through of, of fairly recent uh, things that I've noticed. So one, um, I'll go back to in the spring, we had our government affairs committee come to Washington DC and we spent a couple of days, including an afternoon on the Capitol uh, where we went into the Capitol and had several members of Congress come in and speak to us. Uh, folks like Congressman Garrett Graves who will be here later today from here in Louisiana. Uh, Congressman Bruce Westerman, who's the top Republican on the Natural Resources Committee, potentially the chairman here in a few months. Uh, Representative Debbie Dingell, uh, whose father-in-law, John Dingell, was the originator of the Dingell Johnson Act that created the Sport Fish Restoration Program. Um, she's certainly continued that legacy. Several others. And it was a really great in-depth discussion about issues that we were working on and bills that they were championing on our, on our behalf. And how can we get these things across the finish line? I mean, they knew who we were, we knew them, and it was clear that we'd had a you know, long-standing relationship with these folks to get these things done. And we've done these types of things in the past. I remember 2015 or so having a similar event where we had members of Congress come in and speak to this group. And we talked a little bit about issues back then, but it was a lot of, uh, hey, fishing, that's cool. You know, here's a story of me fishing a while ago, and you know, let me know how I can help, that type of thing. So you fast forward from then to now where we've got these champions on the Hill who are going to bat for us, and despite all the other things that they could be spending their time and energy on, are working on our fisheries conservation issues because we're viewed as relevant and important and things that are important to their constituents that they need to be championing on our behalf. And again, you sort of look at where we were to where we are now, to me that shows that we're, we're making progress and building the relationships that we need to build to get things done. Similar, another example, this is Congressman Graves again. 
I really don't understand what that poster means. Um, maybe you can ask him when he comes here later today, but I thought it was kind of weird and funny, so I'd put it up here. But this was from a hearing a few weeks ago in the House Natural Resources Committee uh, on the, uh, a bill to reauthorize the Magnuson Stevens Act, which is, as we talked about earlier, the primary law governing federal marine fisheries. But this bill, this reauthorization, wasn't something we were heavily engaged in. Uh, one, it didn't do a ton for us. It's not a terrible bill, but it doesn't do a lot to address our priorities, and it's not really going anywhere, at least not this Congress. Um, so we just sort of stepped back and said, you know, we're not going to engage in this one a ton. Um, we'll, uh, we'll work on other stuff at this time until this seems to be gaining more traction. But despite all that, during this hearing, you had multiple members of Congress uh, introducing amendments on our stuff, things like uh, Gulf of Mexico red snapper management, uh, recreational data collection, uh, the right whale issue. And we weren't really asking them to do it. We weren't really drafting language. I mean, usually it's like pulling teeth to get a member of Congress to pay attention to you, much less actively legislate on your topic. So to have members of Congress proactively, without us asking them to, legislating on our stuff was, was pretty remarkable to me. And I, again, looking in the rear view, I remember there was a hearing, it was about 2017, it was before the Modern Fish Act, in the Senate Commerce Committee on the same topic, Magnuson Stevens reauthorization. And during that hearing, the only time recreational fishing came up was just sort of in gener generic terms of, you know, commercial and recreational fishing are important to the nation. But there were no discussions of our specific issues, uh, about recreational fishing specifically. It was all about commercial issues and environmental issues. So to fast forward from then to now, where we've got members not only talking about us, but actively engaging in our policy issues uh, on this subject matter, again, to me shows that um, we're making some progress in, in building relevancy. And this is something, not just ASA, you know, groups like um, Center for Sport Fish Policy, Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership, Congressional Sportsman's Foundation, Outdoor Recreation Roundtable. I think collectively we're making not just recreational fishing, but outdoor recreation in general a much more relevant, um, important political force up on the Hill, and, and a lot of members are taking notice. Last example I'll give uh, for measuring success, this one is a little bit easier to, to measure and put numbers on it, is a sport fishing pack. And I'm a little bit limited what I can say about the pack since not everybody here has signed a prior approval form, but I can talk about facts and, and numbers. And uh, as you can see from the numbers here, historically, the pack, uh, if you go back to you know, early 2000s, we weren't doing a whole lot, you know, a few thousand uh, dollars a cycle, which when there's about 500 or so uh, congressional races going on each uh, cycle, that doesn't get you very far. Uh, Scott Goods, our previous Vice President of Government Affairs, came uh, on board in 2015 and said we need to do something about this and did a great job getting the PAC started. And you can see since that time, uh, steady, significant growth in the PAC. Um, and I'll note that 2020 is not over yet. I'm expecting that bar to, to grow a little bit more between now and the end of the year. But um, to me, this isn't, it's less about the, the dollars and you know, the, the PAC uh, receipts, but more what it signifies, which is you all in the industry, the PAC contributors, the 100 and uh, almost 50 of you that are in the, the industry and the association, value what we're doing in government affairs and appreciate it and recognize the, the benefits it provides to not just you, but the industry that's given so much to you in your careers, that you're willing to put your, your money, your personal money, into something as sort of messy as uh, campaign financing. Uh, to me, again, signals that you all feel like we're, we're moving in the right direction and getting things done on your behalf. And that, to me, is really validating and, and much appreciated. So uh, we'll now move into the issues. So we've got a lot going on. Uh, we won't go through every topic on those lists, but we'll at least pick a handful um, of really top and um, pressing issues and do a, a bit of a deeper dive just to make sure you all are aware of what's going on, what we're doing, and how you can help. So this is the extent of my graphic design skills. I spent a pathetic amount of time trying to put this together to group, at least to start out this issue summary, uh, the good and the bad and the ugly, and this will segue us into the, the rest of the government affairs team. So let's start with the good, kids fishing, who could be against that. So we've been excited over the last several months to work on something called the Youth Coastal Fishing Program Act. Uh, this is a new bill that was just introduced about a month ago that will create a new grant program through the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, around $2 million for projects that take kids fishing in the Great Lakes uh, or in the ocean. Um, uh, through these grants, priority will be given to uh, programs that target underserved communities uh, as an obvious priority of our uh, industry and our association to expand fishing to more diverse audiences, ultimately helping remove barriers and grow the sport. This idea stemmed from a policy standpoint from conversations we were having with folks in the administration about uh, this administration's conservation initiative, America the Beautiful. And one of the pillars of that initiative is um, improving equitable access to the outdoors. And when you look across the federal agencies that do uh, outdoor recreation and, and public land management, 
pretty much all of them, uh, the National Park Service, U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, others have dedicated programs targeted at getting folks into the outdoors, uh, either urban communities, kids in general, uh, bringing folks into these outdoor spaces to enjoy them for all the physical mental health benefits that they provide folks. But in the National Marine Fisheries Service, which tends to be a pretty regulatory heavy agency, not to say they haven't in the past done programs to help uh, support participation, but there's not a dedicated initiative like this within NOAA Fisheries, uh, which is you know, the, the area we're trying to address. Um, so we're excited to see this one move. Obviously, not a lot of time left this year to get this one done, but excited for the momentum we can build uh, into next Congress to see this one move. Now on to the bad. So uh, we were really disappointed a few months ago when the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced a, um, a new rule, um, the good part of which was expanding hunting and fishing access in certain wildlife refuges, which has been a consistent um, program that the service has done for the past several years. This one came with a pretty significant catch that lead fishing tackle wasn't going to be allowed in these handful of refuges that uh, hunting and fishing was going to be expanded into, uh, ammunition being implicated as well. Um, the frustrating part for us was there was literally zero scientific evidence provided uh, for this. We asked many times what was the you know, site-specific uh, wildlife management concern in these refuges that would drive a decision like this, and it, it didn't exist. I mentioned the Center for Biological Diversity earlier. They've sued the Fish and Wildlife Service on um, allowing lead tackle and ammo, ammo in refuges in the past, so perhaps there's a connection here as part of a, a settlement agreement to that lawsuit. But nevertheless, we're the ones that are uh, negatively impacted by this. And for an agency that prides itself in being science-based and allowing science to drive management decisions, this is a deeply concerning uh, precedent. So we're thankful to see uh, dozens of members of Congress re react quickly, introduce something called the Protecting Access for Hunters and Anglers Act. Pretty simple bill that says uh, federal land management agencies, specifically the Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, can't regulate lead fishing tackle unless it is approved by the State Fish and Wildlife Agency that the property is located in and is supported by site-specific science, which is very consistent with ASA's position on lead tackle, which we'll be updating this afternoon uh, over the next two days. Um, we're not saying there's never an instance ever where lead tackle might need to be regulated, but that it needs to be supported by science and that the State Fish and Wildlife Agency uh, that is tasked with managing these wildlife resources needs to be the one driving that decision. So I'll now switch to the ugly, and I'm not talking about his looks, but the issue, um, and I'll invite Mike Wayne up on stage to talk about uh, a new challenging issue uh, of North Atlantic right whale vessel speed restrictions. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys about the vessel speed rule for right whales. Um, if you don't know this, right whales are critically endangered. There's less than 350 individual, individual whales left. And uh, the vessel strikes are a source of mortality along with gear entanglements. And NOAA Fisheries has um, the responsibility to protect endangered species like the right whale under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. So let's look at what NOAA Fisheries is proposing to address uh, this issue. So <clears throat> let me orient you to the map here. Um, <clears throat> so here is the Atlantic coast, and you can see different zones laid out along the coast here. And ultimately, um, these zones would be a 10-knot speed limit, and they would exist from November through either April, May, or June, depending on the region that you're in. So let me highlight that for you guys over here. In um, 2008, NOAA Fisheries implemented vessel speed rules for vessels over 65 feet in length. That rule is in these areas here, um, organized around the major ports. And the idea there was to um, reduce the risk where the vessels come into port, right? It's a bottleneck point, that makes sense. These are areas where there's a lot of vessel traffic and when the right whales are coming through, they have the risk of being hit. And so the new proposal would extend down to vessels 35 feet in length. And so from 35, to 65 feet, that's a new regulatory vessel size class, and <clears throat> it would obviously also extend much further than the 2008 zones that were originally proposed. So 
we started asking the question, what, what's the justification for this? You know, fishing is obviously a very important sport for us. Can we protect the right whales and also go fishing and not have to go 10 knots over this entire area for six months of the year? So when we started digging into the analysis, we found some things that kind of raised some flags for us. So for example, um, NOAA Fisheries made the assumption that vessels 35 to 65 feet draft 10 meters of water. So the, the amount of uh, draft depth underneath of a vessel's hull was 10 meters. And you don't have to know a lot about vessels to know that a vessel of that size class does not draft that much water. So we felt like that was a, a pretty significant example of NOAA Fisheries overestimating the risk of that vessel size class to right whales. You know, the draft depth is probably in the one to two meter range for that. So it's not extending down to, to 10 meters. The, the risk is less. And there were other aspects of the rule that we um, looked into, like safety issues about navigating at 10 knots. Does that, you know, when you're out there and a storm comes up, you need to get back to shore. There are some um, deviation provisions in the rule, but we felt like they could have gone further. The economics of this rule, think about how much of an impact uh, it will have on vessel trips, fishing trips, you name it, along the coast here. So what did we do? How did we get involved with this? We worked directly uh, with NOAA Fisheries to try to address some of these issues, bring them up to them, ask them why did they use some of these assumptions? Could we achieve the same conservation benefit with right whales and not to have to have such an expansive speed zone in place for six months of the year. Um, the other thing we did was we raised um, awareness on social media through our Keep America Fishing platform to get folks like you engaged and involved in this issue. You know, it has the, the potential to have huge impacts on, on our industry. We know fishing has great conservation benefits and is a great pastime for a lot of folks out there. So we want to make sure people know about this and express to NOAA Fisheries how they feel about the proposal. And then we also did meetings on the Hill with members of Congress to have those representatives understand the impacts here and be speaking on behalf of uh, the issue and our con us as a constituent. And we worked with the Small Business Administration because we felt like a, this rule would really impact a lot of small businesses given that a lot of the trips like charter boats, et cetera, would be likely canceled if they had to go 10 knots to reach some of the fishing grounds that they could easily have reached under other speeds like 20 or 25 knots. Um, we also worked with the fishery management councils to ensure that uh, they were engaging on the rule. Remember, those councils are the ones that manage all the recreational fisheries across the regions. And so we wanted to make sure that they were providing input and speaking on behalf of our industry as well. So we really tried to drive a huge wave of engagement on this rule. And just to give you an idea of when this would be finalized, uh, I think I looked, there's about 31,000 comments that have been launched on this proposed rule. NOAA Fisheries will have to review all those comments, respond to them, and ultimately uh, put out a final rule. We expect that to come later in 2023. Um, <clears throat> but this was a really important issue. Uh, I, di I don't have a ton of time to go through all of it, but please visit our government affairs meeting and you'll be able to hear a lot more about this issue and all the others. So I'd like to introduce uh, Martha Gaius, our Southeast uh, Fisheries Policy Director, who's gonna take it over, thanks. Mike. Good morning, everyone. So I'm just going to talk for a few minutes about um, one of my perennial topics in the southeast, red snapper. We'll talk about the South Atlantic stock. Um, so this is an ongoing issue for us, but we I guess it went from a simmer to a rolling boil somewhat recently. Um, I have a I guess I have a small success story to share. So red snapper is a big fishery. However, it's a very restricted fishery in the South Atlantic. Um, for the past, since 2010, it's been largely closed, except for a couple of weekend openings here and there um, for the recreational fishery. This year, the recreational season was two days. 
And um, actually, those, you know, those closures have restricted access, which hasn't been great, but they've actually been really successful in rebuilding what was a very overfished stock. And so I've got this graph up here um, with the, all these rainbow colors here. Basically, what you can see here with this big spike, this is the number of fish through time. We're at a point now where, because of these closures, we have more red snapper out there than anyone has seen before in their lifetimes. And so that's a huge success. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the data, but despite that success, uh, we have a recent assessment uh, from which this graph came uh, that indicates that the stock is still overfished. It's a long time, uh, time frame to get to the point where that stock will be completely rebuilt. And unfortunately, it's undergoing overfishing, uh, which means that fish are being removed from the population at an unsustainable rate. And so, because we have these very short seasons, there's not a lot of harvest going on. And the reason why uh, the fishery is considered to be overfishing is basically because there are so many discards. You know, this, as this fishery has become more abundant, which we can see, more people are catching them, whether they want to fish for them or they want to harvest them or not, and they're having to release them because there is a two-day season. And so uh, this has kind of put the South Atlantic Council that operates from North Carolina down through the Florida Keys in a situation where they have to take some kind of action. And so, long story short, uh, recently the, one of the solutions that was put forward for ending this overfishing was some sort of bottom fishing closure. And so, what this would mean would be basically closing down fishing for 55 species, these are all shown on this slide here, uh, either in large areas or for a big chunk of the year so that people stop uh, catching red snapper. So this is alarming for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, we are rebuilding the stock. We are, ma we are making headway and we are having success. And so further restrictions is not the direction that we really want to go. Um, obviously, this would have huge economic impacts for the recreational fishery. Um, and again, this is a fishery that is doing so great, uh, even though we still are, you know, have a way to go. And so um, when this came up, really, ASA's role here was, um, number one, we wanted to bring awareness to this issue to anglers and the recreational fishing community. South Atlantic Council meetings are generally pretty quiet. <laughs> uh, there's usually just a handful of us in the audience. And so, you know, when this came up, like our number one thing was making people aware. We also saw a solution, uh, at least um, in, in the short term, in that there's a bunch of science going on with Atlantic Red Snapper right now. Congress has funded an Atlantic Red Snapper count that is going on right now, and that information is going to be complete and used for a stock assessment that's coming up in the next couple of years. And so, you know, we're kind of thinking, well, it sure would make sense to have that information in front of us before we make a drastic decision where we're cutting uh, access in a significant way. And so uh, we reached out to a lot of you um, and others in the recreational fishing community um, asking uh, y'all to um, join us and asking for the South Atlantic Council and NOAA to hold off on these closures until we have some better information in front of us to make this decision. Um, it got picked up in the media. We've had a lot of engagement. Uh, this got people's attention. Congressman Rutherford from Florida and Representative Murphy from Florida along with 28 of their colleagues, wrote a letter to uh, NOAA asking, uh, you know, for this, let's just get the science in front of us first uh, position before moving forward with any kind of drastic measures. Uh, and then when the council talked about this at their last meeting just last month in Charleston, uh, we were fortunate in that we have so many from the sport fishing industry that are based in that area. And so we had, uh, well, number one, about 1,000 people submitting comments ahead of the meeting or during the meeting you know, uh, in, in opposition to moving forward with closures like this. And then we had industry leaders uh, at the meeting calling into the meeting. We had about 60 people there, which is a huge deal. It was, I was very proud to have so many from the recreational fishing community there um, and explaining how this would impact them and the angling community. And so uh, in the end, right now where we are is the council's decided they're gonna work on ending overfishing, but bottom fishing closures is not part of that equation for right now. And so that's a, you know, a minor victory, huge victory. We still have a way to go in figuring out how to move forward with Red Snapper management successfully in the future. But, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a proud moment for me. 
So uh, anyhow, anyhow, I'm going to hand it over to Gary Jennings next. He is our uh, leader for the Keep Florida Fishing Initiative. He's going to talk about Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, thank you, Martha. I'm, I've been uh, really fortunate uh, over the last seven years. I've been able to work with uh, two really outstanding uh, Southeast policy directors, um, Kelly Ralston and, and Martha. And, They've really done a lot to make my job a lot easier, so I just wanted to publicly thank them for that. Um, so I'd also like to thank you guys for attending the summit. We as ASA staff really enjoy the chance to see you and get to talk with you in person about the uh, issues that we're working on. And what I'm gonna do is give kind of an update on one of my areas of focus, which is the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary Restoration Blueprint. Um, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary was formed about 30 years ago when Florida had about 70, or excuse me, 700,000 registered boats. This year, FWC announced that there are over 1 million registered boats in the state of Florida. And the restoration blueprint is an effort to better protect the Keys while still allowing reasonable access uh, to the 3,800 square miles that encompass the sanctuary. This is the first major revision that they've done uh, for the sanctuary since 1997. Now the sanctuary has an advisory council that provides input to the NOAA sanctuary staff on how to best manage the area. And this advisory council is made up of uh, stakeholder user groups that include diving, recreational and commercial fishing, uh, boating, NGOs, local, state and federal government entities. After attending these sanctuary meetings for around five years, I was appointed to the council as a recreational fishing alternate. And that allows me a place at the table and it allows ASA to be better informed. 98% of the recommendations for the restoration blueprint were generated through public input uh, from partners, stakeholders, and recreational and commercial users. So in 2019, a draft environmental impact study was brought forth with four options presented for each suggested change. One of those options was listed as the preferred option. After reviewing the public comments and making adjustments, this latest version was then presented and called the draft rule. Now public comment on the draft rule actually ends today, October 26, and ASA worked with a coalition of angling groups that included Bonefish Tarpon Trust with uh, our ASA alumni, Kelly Ralston, uh, CCA Florida, IGFA, Isla Mirada Charter Boat Association, Lower Keys Guide Association, Florida Keys Guide Association, and several notable captains to submit a joint letter that addressed our areas of concern. And the top of that list included water quality, education, and law enforcement. Other areas that the coalition agreed upon included allowing for responsible access and historical uses, implementation of reasonable polling access near wildlife management areas instead of no access, a need for a robust artificial reef program, support for coral and habitat restoration, and recognizing that FWC and the South Atlantic and Gulf of Mexico Fisheries Management Councils are the controlling agencies for fisheries management. Each of these groups then individually submitted more detailed comments on specific areas of concern that they had. Now the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary staff has made a very good effort to listen to the concerns of the public and make adjust adjustments to the plan where warranted. The revised blueprint has much, a much less aggressive stance towards anglers and boaters than the first draft did, which actually included large no anchor and no fishing zones. We are optimistic that the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary will strike a reasonable balance between access and resource protection. The plan will now go through a lengthy review process amongst several entities, including the US Congress and the state of Florida. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Larry Phillips, and he is our Pacific Fisheries Policy Director. Uh, good morning. 
So uh, after coming on with ASA about seven months in, there was, there was certainly no lack of, of issues on the West Coast to deal with. And, and uh, so we, we hit the ground running. One of those issues that hit us front and center was the... Uh, Uh, 30 by 30, and following in the, the footsteps of the America the Beautiful Initiative, uh, Governor Newsom announced uh, the executive order N8220 that designated that would designate about 30 percent of state waters to be put into conservation easement and conservation con uh, consideration. That that challenge, excuse me, uh, that challenge certainly has a significant potential to have a significant impact on recreational fishing in the state of California. Many of the members here have been involved in this far before I came on. But the challenges with this initiative are uh, only lands that are, will be considered durably protected if they're closed to fishing. Um, that is a significant departure from the, the, the conversations that were happening around America the Beautiful. Um, marine sanctuaries that are established it, it will not be considered as part of this sanctuary, part of the durably protected lands. And that, that potentially has a, a catastrophic effect on recreational fishing. Um, the most recent uh, conversations happened with California Natural Resource Agency when they presented the findings, um, the, the status report to the California Fish and Wildlife Agency that defined the approach moving forward in terms of uh, um, incorporating the, the uh, coordinating committee. The coordinating committee is uh, members, 18 members of the membership. None of the members are representing the recreational industry. The only membership that was even close to representing the, the industry was the uh, California Trout. California Trout is, um, we've reached out to them. We haven't had uh, any conversations about their approach and this is a significant problem. Oh, excuse me. The, the, the biggest challenge I see with this is that we are currently um, approaching this from a conservation standpoint. The industry forever has um, used this approach to, um, excuse me, the industry has, has taken a conservation approach to management. We have been advocates for conservation from day one. We feel marginalized. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the um, coalition has struggled. We, we, there's probably 15 of us that have provided a letter to California Natural Resource Agency that identify the, the needs that we have and those have been disregarded completely. So the approach we're taking right now is to continue to advocate for, for this conservation and um, check in with Governor Newsom and the California um, Fish and Wildlife Agency to make those changes and move forward. I apologize, I'm very nervous. Um, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a much deeper dive into this this afternoon. So at four o'clock, we'll talk about this and other issues that are important to the West Coast. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to Connor Devins. Thank you, Larry. Um, preventing the introduction and controlling the spread of aquatic invasive species has been a long time priority for ASA. Um, from Asian carp in the southeast to sea lamprey in the Great Lakes to invasive aquatic plants like giant salvinia in Texas, uh, aquatic invasive species take a diverse but substantial impact on recreational fisheries. Uh, and whether that's, you know, taking the form of outcompeting game fish for food or disrupting habitat or even direct predation, uh, collectively the impacts of AIS amount to a substantial economic impact. ASA, with uh, the help of our members and our partners, has found uh, some success in advocating on AIS issues in recent years. Uh, whether that's uh, you know, through appropriation cycles and ASA's requests for uh, increases to the Fish and Wildlife Service's AIS budget being reflected in congressional spending bills, whether that's the Brandon Road Lock and Dam project, which uh, is a, a project in Illinois, um, which proposes to install a barrier system to prevent the spread of Asian carp uh, from Illinois into the Great Lakes, 
receiving a, or set to receive potentially an increase in the federal cost share in this year's uh, Water Resources Development Act, or whether that's uh, taking a look at things like uh, watercraft inspections and decontaminations, which often present long wait times for boaters and anglers, and making sure that efforts to mitigate the spread of invasive mussels uh, by way of boats do not come at the expense of angler access. So given these uh, kind of myriad but still uh, marginal successes, uh, you know, ASA has seen that its briefings, coalitional work, and direct engagement uh, has had some, some limited successes. But with that said, AIS policy issues are persistent and, uh, you know, can be just as persistent as the invasive species themselves. And with responsibility for AIS prevention and control split between a dozen federal agencies and just about every state fish and wildlife agency, uh, the task of controlling aquatic invasive species uh, is a, a substantial lift. So that's where the AIS Commission comes in. Uh, working with our members and working with partners at Yamaha, Yeti, Boat US, uh, NMMA, TRCP, many of the groups you've heard mentioned uh, by, by uh, my colleagues earlier today, uh, ASA worked to launch a commission loosely modeled off of the Moore Steel Report, which delivered recommendations for marine recreational fisheries uh, conservations. Uh, the uh, commission, which is comprised of leaders not only from these groups, but of leading academics, of uh, voices from state and tribal agencies, uh, as, as well as uh, pro anglers and boaters, uh, you know, aims to take a holistic look at the aquatic invasive species problem and has built on the diverse composition of the commission itself with external scoping meetings that have sought input uh, from communities of, of state and tribal leaders, from industry itself, from state or from um, academics as well. And those external scoping meetings, which began at ICAST and uh, have, have gone on through the summer and into the fall, are beginning to culminate into a series of recommendations uh, that will be delivered in a report later this, uh, this year. So as the Commission develops its report, a series of priorities are emerging uh, for uh, reform in, in uh, aquatic invasive species management and prevention. Uh, those take the shape of modernizing existing legislation uh, addressing AIS, like the Lacey Act, which was passed uh, right after the turn of the century uh, and has not really been modernized since. Uh, the, it's also taken a look at strategic and targeted funding to give resource managers at the state and tribal level the uh, resources they need to sufficiently address AIS as well as providing for interstate and federal state coordination, uh, maintaining access for anglers and boaters, uh, and making sure that uh, anglers and boaters are not only uh, maintained, their access not only maintained, but that they are actively engaged, educated, and recruited to be a part of the solution, including through the harvest of AIS. So whether that's specific policy recommendations like certification waivers for the processing of blue catfish, or uh, whether that's incentives for research to develop new tools to address AIS, uh, ASA is planning to lean on its, its coalitional work, its work with its members, and its history of bipartisan advocacy to ensure that these recommendations from this commission are carried through into legislation uh, that, that we uh, aim to, to begin working towards next year. Um, and we believe that this commission is a, a significant step forward uh, to bring together the kinds of, of ideas and voices and groups uh, that can begin to relieve recreational fisheries of the pressure uh, that they face from aquatic invasive species. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna send it back over to Mike Leonard and we will uh, wrap up the session. All right, quick round of applause to the government affairs team, please. Great job, everybody. All right. And I told you all we like to talk, and we already ran long. So we'll wrap up there. Um, Mary Beth already talked about all the communication channels we have, Keep America Fishing, the podcast, YouTube. Please check those out. We've pushed a ton of content out. Please read it and, and take action.